I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. As you probably know, uh, after the Buddha's awakening, he uh, wandered a bit and encountered, as best we know, a handful of people that he uh, practiced with. And they could tell immediately that something remarkable, remarkable, had um, happened for him. And they asked him, well, what happened? Well, can you teach us some? And he, he, he said, okay. And either at that time or at some point fairly soon after that, he described what he had experienced in terms of th four truths. Truths for noble ones. Uh, truths that make us noble and truths that um, draw what is noble within us. Now, the word truth itself is a little tricky. And as uh, is taught in early Buddhism, and also as wonderful modern teachers, such as Stephen Batchelor have pointed out, um, these so-called truths are probably better understood as practices. So instead of philosophizing about or conceptualizing or arguing about, is it true or not true? Much more pragmatically, which was the Buddha's central impetus in, for himself and in his teaching, pragmatic, what's helpful. The better way to relate to these for, call them things, as it is as practices. And, uh, Essentially, we are to recognize the um, uh, dukkha. We, we are to recognize that um, there are sometimes painful experiences in life. Uh, first, we are to recognize also that even our happiest experiences inevitably change because all experiences are impermanent. They're dynamic, they're changing, sometimes changing altogether. And we are to recognize, firstly, that all experiences, and in fact, pretty much all phenomena in, in the material world, uh, are of the nature to be made of parts that are connected and changing. So they are empty of solidity and thus incapable of, uh, in any single case of providing lasting happiness. In other words, everything is relational and processual. We are to recognize this. That starts our practice, to recognize it. Second, we are to um, also recognize that when we add craving, to dukkha, to the fact that living includes painful experiences, pleasant experiences, and all experiences are dynamic and substantial, relational and changing. When we apply craving to that, we suffer. We get upset, we create conflicts with others, we become discontent, we become driven, frustrated, pressured, um, unhappy. And then our third task, so recognizing dukkha in its three aspects that I've described. Also understanding that um, it is when we apply craving to dukkha, that we suffer, we are third to gradually cease craving, cessation 
including in its ultimate non-ordinary forms of consciousness as an opening into nirvana, we are to we are to cease, we are to practice the cessation of craving. And then fourth, our task, our fourth task, is to um, engage and cultivate the qualities that are acquired uh, in the Eightfold Path. Qualities such as wise view, wise intention, wise effort, wise concentration, wise livelihood, and so forth. So we have these four tasks. It's a way to understand practice, right? We are to recognize, whoa, <laughs> experiences are dukkha. They're not bad. Uh, even the best experiences are dukkha. Even the experiences of an enlightened being are dukkha. Uh, the experiences uh, of great inner peace are of the nature of dukkha, in that they're uh, emptily occurring, incapable of providing at any single moment, permanent happiness, because they keep changing. Uh, and we have the task to understand the impact of craving. Uh, we have the task of ceasing craving, and we have the task of walking the path. Beautiful way to understand practice. All right. I'd like to focus on that second task, uh, and the third task, really, of uh, craving less. <laughs> rather than more. There are many schools of Buddhism. And to kind of borrow a, a, a point made by Joseph Goldstein, of all the various developments of Buddhism over 2,500 years, uh, growing like a wonderful, magnificent tree from a single trunk, deeply rooted in the Buddha's own realization, and then with mighty limbs and branches, and then finally twigs and leaves extending out. In all of that, no Buddhist teacher recommends craving more, right? And so let's explore the process of craving less in the present. And so here I want to approach this as an exploration with you, as a kind of experiential re uh, uh, exploration, in, especially in four aspects. So I invite you to be aware in the present of craving more or less. And this talk and this topic uh, uh, are for me a little big thing. It seems so little in the moment, in the present. More craving, less craving. And yet it's such a big thing. Craving more, craving less. Seems so little. And it's such a big thing. So I'm inviting you into an awareness of how craving occurs for you broadly. Now, there are extremes of craving, certainly. And people have asked in the chat, well, what about if you're grappling with addiction? That's a very intense form of craving. Um, and there are also forms of craving uh, speaking of some examples for me recently, uh, a little subtle thing. So uh, my wife and I are doing a little travel in a couple of months, and she asked me to check in on something related to a place we'll be staying. And my first reaction was, Ugh, one more thing. So in the moment, you know, I contracted around it. I didn't want it. I kind of pushed it away. That's a kind of craving in the moment. Or... Uh, there you are, you're rolling along, and, and you realize that somebody else is getting more credit than you are. Uh, and in that moment, uh, you want more credit. That's a kind of craving. Uh, let's say you're aware of mistakes you've made, or maybe a, big, a particular mistake, and when, it, when you're aware of it, you feel bad, you feel re you regret it, you have remorse. So that right there is an unpleasant experience. But then you want it to go away. Ugh, you don't want to feel that. You want to make it go away. That too is a kind of craving. So 
So I want to invite you to be aware of four indicators of craving. The first of these is a sense of insistence, demand, being adamant, um, must. Uh, sometimes that appears around, for example, arguing a position, being right, you know, my view must be right. It is right. You need to accept that I'm right. You need to. You have to. You must. It might have qualities, particularly around extreme forms of addiction, like I must have that drink. I must have that uh, hit of marijuana. I must have it. I got to have it. Any sense of got to, got to have to, must. On the other hand, in the moment, what's the opposite of that? You might make some comments if you like, as you reflect. Uh, what's the opposite of must? It's typically a sense of acceptance, allowing non-attachment to a result. You could like the result, you value the result, but it doesn't have that quality of insistence or demand, right? There could be as, who is it? Tony points out disenchantment, a kind of, uh, you know, a sort of enlightened meh, <laughs> I think about the inner ad agency and the subcortical ancient, you know, rising 200 or so million years ago parts of the brain that they're like an inner ad agency, uh, you know, selling us on how great, a, you know, a pleasure would be or how horrible a threat would be. And yet when it actually happens, it's not so horrible. And so the kind of the release of the insistence around around that you know get the get the carrot avoid the stick um the opposite of that insistence is the sense of um allowing opening um accepting knowing that you'll be okay even if you don't get it right there can we be mindful moment by moment of quality of insisting or allowing. Right there. It's the little big thing, isn't it? And which side, I think of this as a, a roof that's pitched. You're on the roof, you're in, you're you, but which side are you on? Relate in terms of whatever the facts may be. You know, the roof is the roof. Events are events, conditions are conditions. What's occurring in your experience in the moment is what is occurring. And are you on the craving side of the roof in which you're insisting? It's framed as insisting. There's a lot of insisting in it. Or is there a lot of allowing, accepting, disenchanting? Yeah. Can you feel that? A second quality, very much in craving, is a sense of contraction, Con holding tight. Someone puts it, 1969. Um, contraction, you could kind of feel it in your body, right? Um, so lately I've been kind of laughing at myself more than usual. <laughs> My tendency to chase the red ball. And I, I probably talked about this, I think, some weeks ago, where, you know, I'm, it's, our, it's our nature to chase the bull. We crave the bull. And biologically, animals uh, that were not uh, very motivated by craving were much less likely to pass on their genes. So it's natural to crave. It's not a sin. It's not 
pathological. It's natural. The problem is that it naturally creates suffering <laughs> when we apply craving to the inherent nature of experiences to be dukkha, to be made of parts that are connected and changing, to sometimes be unpleasant, and even if they're unpleasant, they pass through our fingers in the present. So um, here we have this sense of contraction, and we can contract around the ball, right? So my, I see the, so I'm, I'm trained. In addition to our biology, culture rewards us for getting the ball, right? So I have a highly trained mind that uh, essentially, you know, sees the ball, values the ball, wants the ball, pursues the ball, gets the ball, and looks for the next ball. And in that process, there's an insistence to be sure about the ball. Got to have the ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like a dog chasing a ball. I'm like a dog chasing a ball. And it's the nature of the dog to chase the ball. It's not a bad doggy. And wow, in the process of chasing the ball, the dog runs into traffic and creates risks and bumps into people and knocks over furniture. Ah, ah. And in that, there's often a sense of bodily contraction. We're contracting around the object of desire, right? That part of the whole, rather than seeing the whole, we're locked onto that part. We're contracting around that part perceptually. And in your body, you can feel the contraction, a little contraction in that craving. So you can be mindful of that. That's a clue. What's the opposite of that contracting? What's the ceasing, cessation of that contracting? It's opening, like we focused on in the meditation today. It's opening out. It's going wide. Whew. It's seeing the whole. You know, it's opening the hand. I read this line uh, recently from uh, the great poet Jane Hirschfield. I said essentially a closed fist can only do one thing. It can basically bang on stuff. Boom, boom. That's what a closed fist can do. But an open hand can do an infinite variety of things. It is very wieldy. And so we can open. So what's... And you can just tell, you know, you can tell a, a mind that is closed, that's positional, that is righteous, it's contracted um, around something versus or distinct from a mind that is open. You know, we have the line from Suzuki Roshi, um, an expert mind has very few possibilities, but a beginner's mind has many. It's very open. So again, you can feel it in your body. You know, are you getting contracted or can you sustain like an open heartedness? Can the shoulders rise, the chest open? <sighs> can there be the opening of a breath? Such a little thing, right? Contraction, contracting, opening, narrowing, expanding. Such a little thing. And yet right there is the tipping point between suffering or not suffering, more suffering or less suffering, more harming, less harming. How about a third quality? Third quality, the sense of pressure, a sense of drive that gets mingled with insisting and contracting. But I think of uh, the sense of drive or pressure as like energy for, you know, velocity, accelerating, you know, in pursuit, right? Pressure. And it can feel pressured. Uh, it, it feels like, you know, there's pressure in you or you feel pressured by other people whose craving is infecting you <laughs> or producing craving in you because they're pressing you pressured 
right? And biologically, to simplify a lot of stuff, when there's an expectation of a reward or a an attempt, to, a prediction of a gaining of a reward in the brain, and yet a falling short in the moment, so we're not getting the reward. There's a gap between ideal and actual, uh, between reward and um, current reality. Uh, when there's that gap, dopamine levels in effect can kind of drop. And in that dropping of them, there's a sense of dysphoria, unpleasantness, unhappiness. We don't like it. So, and that creates a, a motivational pressure, a drive pressure to, to get it so that there's no longer a gap between the aim and the actual pressure. Uh, biologically, pressure in particular comes from a sense of needs unmet. Understandably, you know, it's dry, it's the force of drive. Um, something is missing, something is wrong. We're driven. Okay. Well, for you, what's the opposite? Or what happens when pressure ceases? What replaces it? What's the alternative? There are different words, but one in particular I'd like to draw your attention to is the sense of feeling content. You're content already. There's no pressure. Also, pressure can often feel like it's being done to us. You know, we have to satisfy the pressure. We have to feed the beast to make it calm down. It's, be, it's happening to us. An alternative is to feel lived by wholesome purposes, lived by love, lived by um, wholesome ambition to actualize your capabilities and to be successful in the world and to, or, and, or purposes that live through you to help others, to contribute, to raise a family, to help your neighbors. That's very different when you feel like something beautiful is moving through you and carrying you along then you don't feel pressured. You're still going after important goals. There can still be a quality of passion and enthusiasm, but it's not pressure. It's like the difference between pressure and enthusiasm, delight. They feel so different, don't they? You know, uh, the root of the word for enthusiasm I learned in Greek is endeos, the divine within, something august, something beautiful, something even um, extraordinary moving through us when we are enthusiastic about something. A person who's pressured could look very active, very intense, da -da, but there's, this, there, there, there's a discontent in it. While on the other hand, the contrast is when we're in a sense of feeling um, enthusiastic, delighted, playful, like pressure is the antithesis of play. Now, of course, actually, I'll, I'll say this as a general point and come back to it. You know, I'm, I live in the real world and I'm intensely interested in how we can stay on this side of the roof of the mind. <laughs> this side, more craving. This side, ceasing craving, less craving, right? How can we stay on this side when external conditions are really challenging, let's say, like a high stakes situation, like a Super Bowl? How do we be in that very high stakes situation while retaining a core? that has inner freedom in it. Um, 
It could be others who are putting pressure on us while we retain the sense of being lived by our purposes with enthusiasm, even a quality of delight uh, and, a, and a playfulness you know, at the core of it all. Right there, what a difference, you know? You can apply this difference at work, at home, you know, pressured, content, enthusiastic, playful, pressured, driven, pushed, compelled, or not. Right there, such a little thing, isn't it? And such a big one in the moment. Now, of course, as we recognize the difference between more or less craving in these particular ways around insistence or allowing, contracting or opening, pressuring or playing, uh, then the question becomes, how do we develop the latter, you know, uh, as a habit, as a trait inside us? And that's a matter of ongoing practice over time. Uh, Sometimes it can also include addressing our conditions and our circumstances, our relationships and our friends. So it's they are more conducive to or more supportive of resting on this side of the house of the mind, the roof of the mind, uh, less craving. That's all really part of it. I'm in particular, I'm drawing your attention to where practice happens mainly, which is in the present. So that in the present, there's a greater mindfulness of more or less insistence, more or less contraction, more or less pressure. And as we become more and more mindful in the moment, in an increasingly granular, even subtle way, we are more able to be mindful of the habit of craving as it arises and disengage from it, withdraw fuel from it, definitely not hop on board it. It's sort of, here we are continually. <laughs> Another metaphor, at the train station, and there are two tracks. Here we are, one track, the other track. And, you know, trains are continually coming on each of the tracks. One of the track is craving. It's the craving track. And the other track is the ceasing craving track. And at any moment, the question is, which train are we on? and Or which one are we, are we about to get on? And very often, when the trains come by us, they're not yet moving full speed. We're not yet on one or the other. We could kind of lean on into one or we could lean into the other. And being mindful in the moment of leaning into insisting or leaning into letting go, leaning into contracting or leaning into going wide, right? Leaning into pressure, leaning into content already, right? Right there, such a little thing, moment by moment. Which train will you hop on board? moment by moment, so powerful. So number four, draw your attention to, and there will be five actually. Number four, more or less self. Wow. Uh, as the sense of self increases, so typically does clinging of various kinds. It's also true the other way. As craving or clinging increases, the sense of self tends to increase as well. So, such a little thing, more or less self in the moment. On the one hand, could there be a very, could there be a sense of possessing mine? I gotta have it, right? And there's the, there's the gotta, the insisting. And then there's the I who gotta, 
right? How about um, identifying with something, like a position or a, an object that's me? Huh? That fosters craving. Or taking things really personally. Oh, how dare you? What an affront, right? Getting caught up in resenting. Resenting is craving. Being aggrieved is craving. Grievances that are all so personal, aren't they? Even if they affect other people, we, I, are getting caught up in what has happened to another person. More or less self, right? You can just watch it. You just get caught up in I this, me that, mine, you know, there. On the other hand, there could be less sense of taking things personally. More of a sense that what's happening is happening and there's a particular body mind with a name tag. There's Georging, there's Ricking, right? There's uh, Maureening, uh, Ayeliing, Catherineing, Madisoning, you know, yay. Uh, there, are the, there are those. Uh, that's happening, but it's much more impersonal. Not dissociated, but connected to kind of everything un unfolding locally. You know, right there, you know, is there a heightened sense of getting your ego caught up in it? Um, taking it particularly personally, getting fixated on, you know, your own positions? and Or is there more of a poof? Letting go of that. That's like a fourth thing to notice, right on that, right on the razor's edge there, right on the the tip of the roof. More self, more selfing, or a releasing of the activity of selfing in the moment. Okay? And then Last one, and then I'll open it up. See what you've got to say about it. This is a this is a basically I'm I'm encouraging a practice. The Buddha talked about the task, right? And one way to explore the task of ceasing craving, alongside the task of understanding the impact of craving in more and more granular and subtle ways, um, as we engage that task in the present, we become much more mindful of the process of craving which then tips the dominoes, falling with suffering as a result. The fifth distinction to notice in the, in the moment is what the Buddha called becoming compared to being. So biologically, again, you know, animals that were really good at predicting and becoming and planning and imagining a future and imagining themselves in that future, they were more likely to have survived. And we are their great-grandchildren. Here we are today. Okay. And there's a place for imagining yourself in a certain future. There's a place for that. There's a place for planning. There's a place for that. But very often what you'll find is that inherent in a process of craving is some quality of becoming distinct from being. Very often we are orienting around becoming because there's a sense somewhere of dissatisfaction with what we are already being. I'm becoming a certain kind of a person or I'm becoming a person who is loved or I, I am becoming less stressed because I'm stressed right now. And this is kind of tricky because there's a place for being helpful to ourselves, being on our own side, right? 
But on the other hand, you can watch the difference in your mind between leaning into a future that you want to grasp and claim, which are kind of pre-craving, <laughs> on the road to craving, leaning into craving, grasping, claiming, right? Which involves becoming. And it's very different to, to experience abiding in being, simply being already okay, already content, already full, through which processes and motivations and plans and actions are flowing, flowing through being, without getting caught up in attaching to what we hope to become. Being distinct from becoming. So to summarize and finish and then see what you make of all this, I'm inviting you into a deepening mindfulness of more or less craving in your body, in your emotions, in the present, right? Indicated by any one of these five distinctions, right? More or less insisting, insisting or allowing. Contracting or opening. Pressure or contentment. More self, less self. Becoming or being. now as you practice. And then see what it's like to rest more and more in your home, in our home base, our, our nature, what is natural to us, really, um, in which uh, we have and accepting, allowingness for whatever's arising, not resisting it, being at home uh, in a, a quality of uh, openness, spaciousness, curiosity, invitation, welcoming uh, at home uh, in a sense of feeling content, and pursuing goals on the basis of feeling lived by purposes, and with a sense of presence and awareness, but not a contraction into self, and a resting in a sense of being. You know, these qualities all together, being increasingly at home in them, finding these as your natural home. So that as you dwell increasingly in this natural home, um, it becomes more and more your ground. And if you leave home briefly, you come back to it more rapidly. And you can be at home there with others too. Okay, well, what do you make of all this? So I have a lovely question from Julia Harris, Julia 23 after. Is there a conflict between setting healthy boundaries and insisting? It's really great. Um, I made a kind of distinction between this side of the roof and that side of the roof, like it's binary and dualistic. In reality, it's more like, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> The mind is like a complicated uh, mosaic. And I'll describe it like this, green tiles, uh, gray tiles, and red tiles. Green tiles being uh, less craving, red tiles more craving. And so at any moment in your mosaic, is there more or less green or red? 
So it may be that there needs to be a kind of firmness when we're setting boundaries with someone. And with them, we may be basically saying that that is a condition of an ongoing sort of relationship with them. Uh, that's That we are in, insisting in that sense. But in the mind, in your own mind, there could be an ultimate resting in um, equanimity about it and knowing that what you are insisting that they do, they may not do. And uh, finding a way to uh, to be ultimately uh, allowing of that and at peace about that. So for me, that's how I would talk about it. And I find actually that the more we're rested in the more green lights, more green tiles than red lights in the moment, uh, when we do bring a gravity to other people and a clear communication of what's needed, it tends to land a lot better, right? Uh, it's, it's really interesting, paradoxically, the more that we are in our own minds not insisting, the more powerful our dignified, grave, serious communications can be. Okay, so let's see more. Patience, fantastic. I'm so glad, Armin, at 25 past, you brought up patience. Patience is one of the six perfections of a awakened being, and we are perfecting these qualities along the way. Patience, it sounds so down to earth, and it's wonderful, because in patience, you're not insisting. You know, you're, you're being present with what is. Um, you may wish it were different because it might be real unpleasant or it might be bad. Um, but there's patience about it. You're not impatient. I've, I've been really watching my own impatience, uh, you know, in which I see the ball, right? And it's a good ball. We, we really ought to get the ball. Let's say, we, trust me on that. <laughs> it's a particular ball. We really ought to feed children. Right, we really ought to preserve democracy. We really ought to, uh, you know, do a certain kind of uh, task at, at work. We really ought to do that. Uh, and and then I can be in situations where I'm watching other people, and it's taken them a while to get it, or and and I can get a little impatient about it. Hey, don't you see the ball? Right, uh, but no, <laughs> right there, craving and suffering, like hurry up. Get the ball, you know. <laughs> Hurry up. Uh, pressure. Hurry up. Pressure. Suffering. Okay. So let's see. I love these summaries. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah. What do we do when, in the moment, we're there's intense craving? Uh, uh, someone earlier brought up again, like I said, addiction. Um, in the moment, ninety nine percent of you might be on this side of the roof. 99 of the 100 uh, lights are flashing red, let's say, but there's one. Can there be just one that's flashing green? And that makes all the difference in the world. Because then if there's that one part of you that can simply say to yourself, so craving, <laughs> so triggered, so, you know, ah, and I think occasionally there's a place for survival or for protecting those we love to just go full red, if you have to, for a noble purpose. Going full red for a green purpose. Sometimes we got to do it. You got to go full red to run into the building and get your kids' teddy bear, your shoes, your car keys, and your dissertation discs, you know, because your apartment building might be about to burn to the ground. That's a true story. Uh, yeah, no apologies for full red. And bless people who for the sake of all of us are willing to go into full red for the sake of the greater green. Thank you. Thank you, first responders. Thank you, um, you know, people who protect us. Um, and so um, I think there's a place for that. That said, you want to move out of red <laughs> as soon as you can. Uh, you want the red, to, the, you want the green ideally to gradually spread. Uh, you want to learn over time, what was it that just flipped that switch and bam, the whole board lit up red? 
So then you're going to be less in, inclined or less triggered or less vulnerable to that in the future. There's a, there's a place for all that. Um, but I find that so much what's really important is to establish yourself in it and in effect that, you know, in, in identify with that one tile in the 100 tile mosaic, let's say, that one tile that is green. Establish that as your beachhead. That's your secure base. And you can rest in the knowing. Yeah, so much red. Don't do anything stupid, Rick. <laughs> you know, full red, whew, slow it down. <laughs> Don't say it. Don't push that email. Don't send it. Whew. And that one part of you that's green knows this. And then it gradually spreads, you know, onto the whole board. And it may take many minutes or even hours to or days even to come out. Huh. And there may still be a pocket of red that about that person or that topic, that issue. Um, there are certain topics that really, for me, have to do with my loyalty to others that poof, you bring those up for me and there's a pocket of red <laughs> in that mind. But the bulk of me knows don't, you know, use that red. Don't let it use you, right? Use that intensity. Use that passion. Use that anger. Use that outrage, that disgust. Use it, but don't let it use you. That makes all the difference in the world. Can we be green about the red? Can we rest in not craving as the space in which craving is occurring? Changes everything. That's why this training that I'm inviting you into, we're training our brains to gradually be more inclined toward green lights than red lights. Gradually more leaning into this side of the roof, right? Leaning there. So more and more, that's the center of our gravity. And it takes a bigger and bigger trigger boom, to drive us from that home base. That's the training. And this training, this distinction that I'm calling you to tonight is exactly that. You know, mindfulness of more craving, resting in less craving. So enjoy yourself this week. That's the invitation, right? Whew. And every moment, what an opportunity. More craving, less craving. <laughs> you know, and seeing if you can disengage from craving and rest more and more in, um, like I was saying, right? Allowing opening, lightening rather than pressuring. Pressure feels so heavy, lightening, um, less selfing and more being. Okay.